Hey everyone, so thanks very much for having me um, to give this talk. So I'm going to be uh, presenting a recorded talk in case we have connectivity issues and I wish I could be with you all um, in Dublin. Um, I can't, um, so uh, I'll be doing this digitally. Um, so the question of who are the Tibetans um, and the origins of Tibetans and Tibetan language families has been a topic that's been featured very prominently in the press. Um, but in archaeological paradigms for the spread of agriculture to the Tibetan plateau, um, farm, the, the, the foragers or, um, uh, are presented as passive conquered or simply just ignored. Um, and this has really um, got to do with this uh, very predominant theory um, in archaeological literature, which is this wave of advance that farmers moved into this area as a wave of advance and foragers as a result are seen as making very little um, linguistic um, or um, genetic contribution to, um, to modern peoples um, on the plateau and its margins. Um, so these colonizing farmers have really dominated the genetic, archaeological, and as a result, linguistic literature um, about the plateau. Um, so for instance, Chiadal, that you see this article here, they make the explicit statement that the source population for this movement is um, composed of Han um, Chinese peoples, one that obviously has um, political implications. Likewise, um, in this discourse about the origins of the Tibetans, um, the role that other languages, non-Tibetic languages like Yalrongic languages may have played is something that's been relatively ignored. So in my talk today, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to present, be presenting you some data about what we know um, about the archaeology of um, the area that currently um, encompasses um, uh, some of the areas where uh, Gelrongic speakers live today, um, and what we understand about the prehistory of the area and how that might inform um, new models um, for thinking about uh, or the, spread of, um, the spread of languages across this area. So first off, um, the the um, according to this current wave of advanced model for expansion to the region, um, so farmers that belong to a culture known as Majayao, um, uh, a culture which has its origins in northwest China and whose farmers practiced millet and pig farming, are seen as being responsible for genetic, archaeological, and linguistic the linguistic heritage of the plateau. So they're seen um, as moving out um, of northwest China at around 6,000 BP um, onto the various margins of the plateau, including the northern plateau, but also um, the southeastern plateau or um, areas that sort of roughly correspond to Andor and Kham. Um, so um, what do we know about um, the Majayal in uh, Gelrongek speaking areas? Well, um, first of all, um, there are several things that, um, that seem to uh, be apparent. So first, um, this culture occupies the area between about um, 5,500 and 4,000 BP. Um, and what's clear is that we do see um, uh, a spread of um, a spread of cultural attributes that um, are very similar um, to those of the Magi Alcor area. We see the same presence of painted vessels. We see the same types of um, uh, of um, uh, daily use wear, and we see the same types of houses. Um, sometimes even with uh, with uh, what appear to be human sacrifices um, in their bases. So there are two key sites um, that um, are worth discussing. So one is uh, Yingpan Shan in Maoxian, which is like Located currently in a Qiang um, cultural area at 1,750 meters above sea level. And then there's the site of Hashio and Aba County um, on the Chabao River. Um, so I'm going to be um, discussing some data from uh, from these two sites um, and what they show um, about uh, migration um, to the area. So at Yingpanshan, what we see, we, data from the Yingpanshan sites so shows that um, people lived at the site in relatively permanent wattle and daub houses that are very similar to those from the Majiao core area in northern China. And another similarity that they share with these houses is the presence um, of these sacrifices that I said in the foundations. Um, so archaeobotanical and um, zooarchaeological evidence also shows that they relied heavily on domesticated pig at the Yingpanshan alongside um, both foxtail and broom corn millet. As I mentioned before, the pottery assemblages, both in terms of their high fired prestige and pottery wear and also their coarser daily wear, are also really dead ringers for pottery assemblages from the Kumajai Alcor area, suggesting that farmers may indeed have moved um, more directly into this area, bringing with them their full um, suite of domesticates, building style, and pottery repertoire with them. 
Um, so I'm not going to get into too many details about the Hashio site um, because I don't have too much time. But one thing I did want to um, to tell you about is that while it might have very similar pottery to um, Yungpanshan based on very limited excavations there, um, we don't really understand too much about housing structure at, at Hashio yet. But there's one key difference. So um, at Yungpanshan, we do see that the diet is overwhelmingly reliant on um, domestic pig. However, at Hashio and at other high elevation sites on the Tibetan plateau, like Zongru on the northeastern plateau or Xiaowanda on the central Tibetan plateau, we actually don't see any domestic animals aside from the dog. Um, so this indicates that there were varying uptakes of far farming throughout this region, and not everybody adopted farming products in the same way, um, potentially also revealing um, some type of difference amongst um, it, in how people um, themselves identified themselves, whether they identified themselves as members of an ethnic group or um, not as members um, uh, as one. So in terms of the cultural historical sequence, um, we see a real shift um, in uh, the Bronze Age um, in this area with the arrival of the Shiguanzang culture um, at around uh, 3,500 um, BP. So um, during this period of time, we no longer um, see uh, people living in permanent settlements, or at least we have found um, very, very few of them, um, almost none of them um, have been found in the region. We see the appearance of these characteristic um, stone cyst burials. Um, they're often primary um, in Humations in these, but there are also um, secondary burials which are found, which indicate that people died in a location potentially far away um, and then um, were um, reburied um, or their bones were replaced um, in this type of burial. Um, in terms of material culture, um, what I haven't um, pictured here is there's a lot of pottery um, that is uh, placed in these burials, but there's also a wide range of different um, bronze um, and other items that show clear connections, um, both with the low-lying areas in China. Um, and so you find um, these, uh, you know, Bashu style daggers, um, but also with other areas of the steppe um, as far um, away as the Ordos um, and uh, Inner Mongolia um, in terms of uh, in terms of decoration. So we carried out a survey um, of, uh, so what I'm going to be mostly presenting here today is a survey that we carried out of the Jiaomuzu and the Chabao River Valleys in Marakang. Um, this is the map of the, um, of the area uh, we surveyed. Um, and um, you can read this publication in the Journal of Field Archaeology that Anka Hein and I published together. Um, so um, the areas in red represent our, um, our survey area. You can tell we did not do a systematic survey um, of the whole area. This is because we were extremely um, limited in terms of time. Um, but also we were limited by a couple of other factors, um, namely one of slope. So for those of you who know this area well, you um, know that there are um, a couple of areas of wide river valleys and then you have extremely steep hills. So the areas with a slope of over 27 degrees were areas that are frankly unsurveyable. Um, even if there were some archaeological remains on these, they would be, um, they would uh, pottery and other stuff would, um, through erosion, fall down to the to the valley bottoms. So we were really interested in trying to um, survey the areas on green. Um, however, our colleagues um, from the Citron Provincial Institute of Archaeology were not willing to um, to do a thorough survey of the higher altitude areas um, for uh, political reasons. So we really focused on um, these lower lying river valleys, with one um, exception of um, an extension um, up here. So what did we found, find? Well, so first of all, um, we found a lot of sites from what we call phase one, which are the Neolithic um, Majayao type of ceramics. And then we found a very small number of phase two or Bronze Age ceramics, and we found these exclusively on Ian Graves. And then we found, yeah, again, a very large amount of phase three um, ceramics that I'll talk about the dating of, but that date to um, the historic period. So um, group one ceramics, this is the distribution of them um, across our different site areas. We didn't find any in the, in the last area area, but we found um, quite a few centered around the lower altitude um, valley bottoms. And most most of these, associated with most of these um, surface ceramics scatter, we could see that these were present in deeply stratified sites where you can see clear strata. So here, um, what we see is the floor of a burnt earth house. Um, and um, these were predominantly uh, uh, basically distributed on the lower altitude um, terraces um, a buttressing um, the Chabal and um, uh, Jiangwuzu rivers. 
Um, as an example of something else we found, um, a number of these sites are actually, we, um, you know, kind of had to hold our breath when we discovered that a number of these sites were really um, at huge risk for discussion. So this is the Baisha Monastery um, in the area, and they were building um, this tower, um, as well as had just built, built this new uh, Buddha at the time that we surveyed, and unfortunately, in the process of doing so, um, they actually uh, dug through what is potentially one of the most important um, Majayao archaeological sites um, in the region. And this heap um, of debris that they uh, pulled out to build this building um, was really, you know, chock a block full um, with material culture um, uh, from here. So this is a site that was um, heavily destroyed during um, this construction. The second um, part of our, the, the, the Bronze Age component or our group two ceramics were only distributed. In fact, we only found them in, um, in uh, one or two um, locations. And we only found them exclusively within these Shuanzang or within these stone cyst tombs. And these were really based on what are pretty opportunistic finds. So in this case, um, we were at Parabatsun and a road was being constructed in an area of higher altitude. Um, and um, this revealed the presence of these stone cyst graves um, that were deeply cut um, into the loess with the typical ceramics and other material culture. Um, but we did not find any of these ceramics um, in um, the river valley bottoms um, or in the rest of our survey area, only um, in graves. Um, so again, um, uh, for phase three ceramics, we now moving to this phase, um, and I'll get into the dating of this in a little bit. Um, we see a similar distribution to what we saw in the Majayao period again. Um, and here um, we basically see these phase three ceramics are distributed throughout the valley bottoms, um, but also in some areas of higher altitude, like this little extension that we did here. And um, when um, we weren't carrying out excavations on the survey, this was just a pedestrian survey, um, we opportunistically saw a couple of um, terrace cuts that actually had um, this period remain. And we didn't see any in the very lower altitude um, the river valleys where the Majayal sites are. But at this one village, what we did see was people had dug a trash pit and we saw some cultural layers there and um, we radiocarbon dated them. And this is basically um, what it showed. So the, what I'm showing here is this is the different dates that um, we carried out um, on material from the region. These gray ones are radiocarbon dates. And you can see that the Neolithic here sort of starts around um, 4,000 or well, 3,500 to about um, 2,500 ish B, B, BC. Um, and then um, we have uh, a couple of dates on um, uh, one radiocarbon date on uh, on the stone cyst tombs that places it at about 1,000 BC, and then some uh, thermoluminescent states here too. So the, the red is thermoluminescent states. So what's really interesting is that this whole scatter that we have um, of both thermoluminescent states on these later ceramics, but also radiocarbon dates, they really sort of date between um, 1000 AD um, and present, which is really interesting um, for the history of the region. The location of where we got these dates from and where the ceramics are distributed suggests that people occupied these valleys quite intensively, but it also suggests potentially that their um, that their sites like this one that was opportunistically found in a trash pit near the village may actually be un located underneath contemporary settlements, which is why we don't see them. There are, as you probably all well know, um, some other interesting historic period um, features um, on the landscape, um, which are these towers um, and um, radiocarbon dates um, by Dahagon um, that, were, that were carried out in various regions suggest that the ones in this area date to um, about the 10th century AD, but some of the earliest ones in central Tibet date to about 250 AD. And there are also historic texts um, from the Eastern Han Dynasty um, annals um, that these were um, built by the Man tribe um, speaking about the Wintran uh, area, I believe. So the um, the territory that these um, that that these towers are found in um, this ex extends um, basically um, from Nyangpo and Kampo um, in the Tibet Autonomous Region um, over um, to uh, what are um, uh, what um, at least Dahagon places in uh, Minya traditional lands. You have the ones in Gal Galrongic speaking areas, and then the ones in Malshian in um, in uh, in uh, in uh, Malshian. 
So what do some of the dates on these towers show? Um, well, so uh, Dachacon still has not made um, the dates um, for uh, the Citron Towers available. Um, however, um, she has made um, the dates from Nyangpo and Gong, uh, Gongbu Jiangda County in the Tibet Autonomous Region available. And um, what these, this appears to show is that these dates are somewhere between, you know, about 250 AD, um, and then they their life uh, ends or their usage seems to end around the 15th century AD, um, or at least construction halts um, around that time. These dates, however, have to really be taken with a bit of a pinch of salt um, because of the old wood problem. So um, trees grow um, uh, every time, every year a tree grows, puts down a ring, and trees can grow over a very long period of time, particularly those in high altitude and high latitude um, locations like the Tibetan Plateau. Um, so, you know, showing here, um, this is about a sequence of about 100 years difference between the core of this tree and between um, the middle of this tree that I'm showing here. So if you got a sample from the middle um, versus from the edge or from underneath the right underneath the bark, you could have um, up to sometimes up to a thousand years um, of error within this. Um, so it's it's possible that some of these um, uh, that some of these were uh, impacted, that some of these dates are impacted by this old wood problem. In fact, it's highly likely. Um, however, um, it, what is clear um, from the series of dates that I'm showing here is that at least construction of these appears to have sort of halted around the 15th century AD and probably likely extends to at least 500 um, or uh, 1000 uh, AD um, in this area. So my talk has sort of left us with a lot more questions um, than uh, than real answers at this point, but I hope that this identifies some avenues for um, future research that both linguists and historians and archaeologists can collaborate on um, in this area. So um, one key question um, for us as archaeologists is why is there a lack of stratified sites in the Bronze Age? Is there a more mobile pastoralist occupation during the Bronze Age? Or are sites, maybe like the historic sites, potentially buried too deeply under contemporary occupations? When do these towers really date to? And then finally, again, where are the historic period sites located? So we found ceramics scatter across large areas from these phase three ceramics, but only in one instance did we actually, in that opportunistic trash pit that people had made, did we actually find evidence um, of an archeological, of a buried archeological site or strata. Um, and the reason, by the way, that, um, ceramics are probably scattered throughout the fields. That's just um, people will use their trash as fertilizer and then you get pottery mixed into the trash and that's how pottery gets distributed across a landscape. But that doesn't mean that that was actually the area that people lived in. Um, or at least that wasn't the precise location that they lived in, but they lived um, in a village in the vicinity, but identifying the village really requires um, more archaeological work. Um, so um, the, the issue of these towers, um, but also, you know, thinking back to the earlier prehistory, um, the Bronze Age and potentially earlier, you know, this raises questions about what was the original territory that Gelrongek speakers occupy, um, and further, what types of material cultural traits are unique to them and what are shared. Um, and um, uh, you know, basically, uh, like, a set, you know, we need to try and reintegrate the important role that are played by non-Tibetic language speakers in this region's history, because a lot of the way that archaeologists have written about this area is, this is the Eastern Tibetan Plateau, or this is part of the Tibetan Plateau, um, associating it with Tibetan language speakers, but that, of course, as many of you know, is really a more recent part um, of the history of this area, and potentially um, uh, does not value the role played by other language speakers in shaping the landscapes of this area um, throughout history. Um, so I'm going to be online um, for any questions, um, and I'd really like to engage in conversation uh, with you all about um, the potentials that uh, history, archaeology, and linguistics can bring together in our understanding of this area. So um, I want to thank all my collaborators, um, particularly from the Citron Provincial Institute of Archaeology and Anka Hain, um, who carried out these surveys, um, these surveys with me. So thank you very much.